Well, I want to welcome everybody who's joining us whenever you're watching this. Thank you for being with us. We are in our second week. Somebody say second. Our second week of a series entitled Proskuneo. Turn to your neighbor and say that. Proskuneo. Turn to your other neighbor now that you've built up some confidence and say that. Proskuneo. Now turn to the neighbor you first talked to and said, I'm speaking Greek. I'm speaking Greek. This is a Greek term that's used in the New Testament over and over again to describe not only an internal state, because we like to often just talk about worship with regards to what's happening on the inside, but it reveals an external posture because there's a connection on what's happening on the inside and what's going on on the outside. I said this to our leaders earlier, Jesus never condemned external praise and worship. He only condemned it when it was devoid of internal connection. When the Pharisees tried to pray real loud and be real demonstrative and show off in front of everybody, but their hearts were far from him, he chastised them. When Mary came and shattered an alabaster box and started scream crying and wiping his dirty feet with her hair, he didn't say a word except that this will be remembered every time the gospel's preached. It's not about expression on the outside that Jesus isn't wanting. He's just wanting it to be connected to the inside. That's what we're after in this series, a worship that is not only about our internal attitude, but our external posture. How many of you know that when you're in conversation with a friend, if you tell them that you're listening and yet your posture is this, turned away from them. Is that really listening? Now you might in fact be hearing them to an extent, but it's not communicating to them or anybody. That's what we call rude. <laughs> that's just flat out rude. But, but that's not communicating a posture of listening. See, we get real spiritual in worship and disconnect our bodies from it and say we're being spiritual. I'm sorry, I'm not mad at anybody. I've been, on, I've been on pastoral retreat and marriage conference this week. I have been in planes, trains, and automobiles. I'm just so happy to be here with everybody. I'm happy to be in the house of God. But he's stirring something in us. And he's teaching us something. Not because we're a Pentecostal church, but because we're a biblical church. This has zero to do with Pentecostalism. Zero. I never preach denomination or network. I preach Jesus in the Bible. I thank God for networks and denominations and everything else, but I'm after what the Bible is teaching us. And sometimes we can get so enmeshed in our church culture, our church upbringing, our experiences, that we say things are normal and standard that the Bible would vehemently disagree with. And so the Word of God offers correction to me, come on, to me, The Lord already whacks me with a two-by-four all week long before I preach this stuff. (laughs) He deals with my heart. I I really try. I tell people this. I really try my hardest because I want to be a pastor of integrity to really implement the things that I'm teaching and not just say stuff. And so I want to try to embody the things that I'm preaching and do my best to lead by example. We're going to be in Joshua 24. Now, this is a very familiar passage, but I believe that by the Spirit, your eyes and my eyes are going to be open to see fresh revelation. How many of you are interested in fresh bread from heaven? The press of heaven is always ready. The oven's always turned on, and the revelation's always ready to flow. He who has an ear, she who has an ear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying. Joshua 24, I'm going to be in verse 14 through verse 19. Joshua 24, verses 14 through 19. Now, therefore, I'll lay some context here in a bit. I'm going to just drive us right into the center of this narrative, then I'll lay some backdrop. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. Ooh. And serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. 
whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Here we go. This is familiar. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery and who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that he went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. Joshua says something that shocks them. Are you ready? Joshua hears their affirmation. Yes, we are going to serve the Lord. And he comes down here in verse 19. And Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. How's that for a pastor? Pastor, I'm ready to serve. No, you're not. Ouch. For he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. And he will not forgive transgressions of your, or your sins if you forsake and serve foreign gods. And the people said, no, but we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, you are witnesses of this against yourselves and to one another. I want to speak to you from this subject, wholehearted worship. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to the word of God. We thank you that it's sharper than any two-edged sword, that it pierces and divides to the depths of who we are and speaks to us right now, right where we are in this season, that encourages us, that pats us on our back and tells us good job, but also puts a hand on our back and says, nope, not that way, this way. That corrects and nudges and leads and guides. We sit under the power of the word of God in Jesus' name, amen. Joshua 24 is what is called a covenant ratification ceremony. A covenant ratification ceremony. How many of you are U.S. history buffs? You like history. I know, I know one. My friend Aaron is one. Uh, if you like U.S. history, you know about the ratification of the Constitution. Ratification is, in some ways, just a rehearsal, a review, a renewal of what has previously been sealed or affirmed. Joshua understands that he is in his last moments. He has marched around city walls, impenetrable city walls, the walls of Jericho. He has walked in silence for six days. He walked in silence on the seventh day for six laps. And on the seventh lap, he let out a shout of praise unto the Lord so loud that God began to break the foundation of the walls in this fortified city and shattered the walls of Jericho so that they could rout their enemies. Joshua was present there. Joshua was present when they were fighting the Amorites and, and God began to keep the sun in the same place so that they had light for battle. And he said, sun, sand, stand still. And the sun stood in its place and they received victory that day over their enemies. Talk about mighty signs and wonders. Joshua was part of this group as they were moving into the land that God had promised to their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph had been carried out through the ministry of Moses and passed down to Joshua. He had defeated countless kings. He had divided now the land between the 12 tribes and had given them the portion that they deserved. And now he came to his final moments and said, it's time to renew what we started a long time ago. It's not enough to just remember what happened 100, 200 years ago. 
It's not enough to remember what happened 50 years ago and say, well, that's going to be good enough to sustain us. Joshua said, we have to get fresh before the Lord. You cannot live off yesterday's encounter. Man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Therefore, we ask, give us this day our daily bread. John 6, I am the bread, Jesus said, that comes down from heaven. You cannot live off of an encounter when you were 15 years old where God met you and then live faithfully for 60 years and just only remember what happened when. There's got to be something fresh. There's got to be something new. I'm not saying that you don't remember those things. We cherish them. We store them up. We call to mind the faithfulness and the goodness of God. But it is not okay to just live there because God wants us to live here and to look there and to anticipate what's coming. So Joshua took them to a historical and theological significant location called Shechem. Shechem is very important in the travel narrative. When Abram was called in Genesis 12, all the way up to this point in the narrative where they're entering into the promised land that had been promised way long ago, Genesis 12, to Abram who was called out of the land of the Ur, the Chaldeans, and said, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and I will give you land and peoples, and I'll multiply you and make your name great among the nations. This was the promise that he gave to Abram in Genesis chapter 12. And do you know where Abram then traveled? He went right after the Genesis 1 through 3 promise and covenant. He went to a place called Shechem and built an altar to the Lord. And he began to worship the Lord. When Jacob was going to meet his brother Esau after living on the run from him and deceiving him and stealing the birthright, he then realized, hey, we've got to reconcile this, so, so I'm going to gather all the people and send them out in front of me, and eventually I'm going to go. Do you know where Jacob went? He went to Shechem. And it was there that he buried the false gods of his wives and made a consecrated commitment to worship the Lord God. It was Shechem that was given to the Kohathites, a division of the Levites, the the priestly tribe. And they were given that land in Shechem to be a place of worship unto the Lord. So Joshua, when he was ready to renew the covenant, he went to the place of worship. Historically, he said, there have been some wells that have been dug by our forefathers and foremothers. And we're going to go back to that place of worship and we're going to connect with God there. You have to build a history. We talked about this last week. You have to build a history and dig some wells and see some places where you've built a history with God that you can go back to that altar and say, you were faithful then, but this is now, and we're doing something fresh now. Shechem was the place of the covenant renewal ceremony where Joshua spoke these very familiar words, but sometimes our familiarization with the passage can rob us from its meaning. Sometimes the translation of Hebrew terms into English terms do not capture the fullness of what's being communicated, and therefore we miss the nuanced way that is trying to be described with regards to worship here. So they're at the historical and theological site of worship in Shechem, and Joshua gave them some keys. Somebody say keys. That means there are some things to unlock things in God. Jesus told Peter, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. There are spiritual principles and keys that unlock things in our life with God. And sometimes we can't access what other people access because we don't have the keys. I'm believing that today the Lord by his Holy Spirit is going to put some keys in our hands that we can begin to unlock wholehearted worship. And all of us be a people who are wholehearted Worshippers. Nobody wants to lift their hand and say, I want to be a half-hearted, half-baked worshiper of God. I want to give half effort and be just get by and be almost a, just kind of right on the edge or maybe even see how bad of a worshiper I can be. Nobody who's truly loving God would say that. They would say, no, I want to be wholehearted in my worship and my consecration to the Lord. He's giving us some keys today. 
Look in verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord. And serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Write this down, the truth about worship. The truth about worship. This is keys that are going to unlock wholehearted worship. There's some truth here. Total, wholehearted, consecrated worship begins with reverential awe. Awe. A-W-E. My southern draw sometimes gets into that word for me. Awe. <laughs> awesome. Uh, full of awe and, and, and wonder. We often say that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom coming from Proverbs chapter 1. But rarely do you hear that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of worship. This text teaches that in a renewed worship commitment, the fear of the Lord is the first key. Here's some truth about worship. The fear of the Lord is the first key that unlocks genuine, real, wholehearted worship. I'm not talking about fear in the sense of you're scared he's going to beat you half to death if you come into his presence. You're scared he's going to strike you down with lightning because of something that you said throughout the world. I'm not, I'm not talking about that kind of fear like you would fear an, an, an employer who is abusive to employees or a, or, or a parental relationship to a child where there is abuse. I'm not talking about that kind of fear. And that's where people often check out and say, you know, I'm done with this fear thing. God's not giving me a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. I'm out of that whole fear thing. I'm checking out. But the nuance of the word in our present day understanding disconnects from what's actually being said. There's a reverential awe and wonder that is inspired in people that leads to wholehearted worship. Deuteronomy 6.13 says, You shall fear only the Lord your God and worship him. Do you see the connection? You're going to fear him, and then out of that fear, here's a coordinating conjunction. We're going to tie two things together. You will fear the Lord, and as a result of that, you're going to worship him. Because the fear of the Lord is not just the beginning of wisdom, but worship. Hallelujah. Psalm 2, the coronation psalm. This has become one of my favorite psalms. This is read of the, of the Davidic king who would come in and rule and break the will of all of the obstinate nations and set up the kingdom of God. It's a prophetic messianic psalm ultimately talking about the return of Jesus and the imposition of the kingdom of God in the earth. But listen to what Psalm 2 said. This would be read at the coronation ceremony for an Israelite king like David. Worship the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son lest He be angry with you and you perish in the way. Kiss the Son lest He be angry with you and you perish in the way. Come with fear and trembling. How can you worship with fear and rejoice with trembling? Do you see even the expression of praise is inculcated within the fear and reverential awe of the Lord? The writer of Hebrews said it like this, Therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. What does acceptable worship looks, look like? It looks like reverence and awe. It looks like amazement and wonder. You say, well, how do I express reverential awe? There are a number of ways that it can be expressed. It can be expressed through the lifting of hands, the kneeling down, laying prostrate or flat down before the Lord. It can be expressed with words. God, you are awesome. You are full of wonder. I'm amazed by you. I come in today to your presence amazed by the very nature of who you are and what you do in the earth. You're holding galaxies together with the word of your mouth. I stand and I'm not coming in just super relaxed and casual like I'm just going to talk to a friend. I know that he's a friend that sticks closer to a brother, but we have lost in our contemporary culture a sacred reverential awe and wonder of the Lord. And sometimes we can get so casual with it that we actually rob ourselves from wholehearted worship because we do not enter with reverential awe. 
and wonder. So the expectation that should be set at the forefront then gets stolen for us and it jades our entire experience of worship through singing because it's not entered in with awe and wonder. That he is both lion and lamb. We love to snuggle up to the lamb of God, but sometimes he's in the corner and his teeth are showing. And he's growling. If you've ever read the account of Jesus examining the activity in the temple, he was actually in the back weaving together a whip. Can you imagine Jesus coming into service, sitting in the back, listening, and just weaving a whip together? I think he does that sometimes. Sometimes we can just approach things so casual, like God doesn't care, it doesn't really matter, it's whatever, it's 30 minutes and I'm done for the week, who cares? And we miss the fruit of wholehearted worship. I love the Lamb of God, but I also love the Lion of Judah. They're one and the same. And, and, and we need to know, this is why C.S. Lewis wrote those beautiful novels, The Chronicles of Narnia, to explain the nature of God is this lion, Aslan. How many of you like that lion? You have seen the movies, read the books. He's trying to describe the nature of God. And yes, they can snuggle up to the mane of the lion, but there are times where the teeth show and the growl comes and the sin enters and the wickedness enters and he goes to devour it. There's a lion in the room. How would you worship if you felt like there was an uncaged lion in the room? The lion of Judah is roaring and inviting us to worship him. There's a reverential awe and wonder. Lions are my favorite animals. They are so majestic and incredible. If you're watching Nat Geo, go ahead and watch a lion documentary. It's incredible to watch them. And that's one of the metaphors we're given. We need to come into the place of reverential awe and move out of the loosey-goosey, doesn't matter, don't really care. There's a lion in the room that we are worshiping. And you better watch out when he gets loosed because he starts growling at sin. I don't have to convict a soul. He's the one who does it. He starts growling at sin. He starts letting out a roar against apathy. He starts screaming with the loudest roar he can unleash that he will be praised. He will be honored. He will be revered for all generations. There's a lion in the room. Wholehearted worship begins with that reverential awe that we're going to the king of glory in the most holy place. But then Joshua says, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him. This term serve is used 15 times in verses 14 through 21, or 24. 14 times. Serve, this Hebrew term, is a form of worship. If you're wondering why we call it Sunday morning service, it's not because anybody's here to serve you. It's because we gathered in to serve him. That's why we're coming to service You're a priest, a New Testament priest. Now, I love serving people, but we're coming together to serve him. And as we serve him, he then flips the script and begins to serve us. As we lift up the high praises of God, it breaks the floodgates of heaven open and the glory begins to flow in the house. There is a service that the Lord wants from us. Fourteen times in a mere ten verses, Joshua said, serve the Lord, worship the Lord, engage in spiritual service to Him. He's after something in our hearts and in our lives. What if we came into the house? This is the truth about worship. And I'm talking now in the context of worship through singing. There are a variety of ways. we got plenty of time in this series to talk about other kinds of worship, of which there are many. But sometimes we get so wide and say worship's everything and then don't describe anything about it. And we just throw terms around and never say. I'm talking about worship through singing, music, the opening of our mouths in gratitude and worship and thanksgiving to God. That's, what, that's the context here. What if we made Sunday service not about what we're comfortable with. 
what songs we like, what, what our preferences are. But what if we came in and said, what do you want? What do you need? What can I give to you? What can I offer you that costs something? What can I give to you that blesses and touches and connects with your heart? What can I sacrifice today? How much can I give up? How much dignity can I give away? How much of a fool can I make myself for the purposes of the kingdom of God? How extravagant can my worship be? How many tears can I pour out? How loud can my voice get? How much worship can I express? in a mere 30, 40 minutes. How much can I sacrifice? What if we made it about serving Him? Look, none of us like every song that's sung. None of us. There are songs that our worship pastors, Hayden and Jessica, will sing that is probably not their most favorite song on, in the whole world. There are songs that are sung that, that we sing that may not be your me- most favorite. Oh, I really don't like that. I'm really not a fan of that one. I don't know how I feel. What if for a change, let's just let's imagine this together. What if we just said, you know what, though? This is about him. I know this isn't my favorite tag. This isn't my favorite chorus. This might not even be my favorite melody or song, but I'm coming into the throne room, and this is about a sacrifice of praise. This is about how extravagant I can give him something, not about me getting something. The beauty in the kingdom is that it's more blessed to give than to receive, but here we go. When you give, you start receiving, pressed down, shaken together. The the floodgates of heaven start start to open up. And when you make it about him, he starts to make his blessings about you. There is a truth about wholehearted worship that centers around the fear of the Lord and service of him. But the service, there are two key words here. There's sincerity and faithfulness. Sincerity and faithfulness. Your translation might have two different words. Sincerity and faithfulness is what the ESV that I'm reading out of has. This term was used in the Old Testament, sincerity, let me deal with that, to describe completeness and freedom from blemishes. It was used to describe the kind of sacrifices that were whole and acceptable to the Lord. You did not give a burnt offering or an animal to be sacrificed that was blemished or spotted. You gave a sincere, this is the same term, a sincere, a complete and free of blemish sacrifice. Sincere worship is not dirty hands lifted to the Lord. Who shall ascend? Now understand this through the lens of grace. This is not condemnation. I'm not saying you have to come in fixed, okay? Understand the series and what we're describing and what we're talking about. Sincerity in worship is this. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who is it that will visit that holy mountain? The one with clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to what is false. That is the person whose worship not only touches God, but God then brings them up. He then brings them up. So I'm going to give you some keys right here about the truth about wholehearted worship. The key to experiencing God in in the gathering is to not soil your spiritual garment Saturday night from watching all manner of filth and then saying, I'm going to get cleaned up tomorrow in church. The key is not living so far from God Monday through Saturday that you feel like he's some distant memory from Sunday that you can't even see where he's at. You don't even know what living for God. You've not even spoken again. And then come in and expect for everything just to be fixed and then made better. God is gracious. He's forgiving. He's merciful. He's loving. He's kind. And he does that, but that's not his preferred method. His preferred method is for us all week long to be putting on those pure and holy garments, making those small decisions of holiness, the little yeses that lead to big yeses, the little no's that lead to big no's. That There's a momentum so that when we come in, I'm not having to stir up. Nobody's having to cheerlead. We are 
are ready and in battle to worship the Lord and start with the call to worship engaged in the presence. That there's not this drumming up for 45 minutes to feel like you have a spiritual heartbeat. Has anybody ever felt that way before? I, I, I've, at some point in your life, you've probably felt that way before, if we're all honest, like where it took like an hour to make you feel like you were halfway spiritually breathing. Felt like about halfway through after he was screaming at me for 30 minutes, I felt something. <laughs> no, 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 but, but there's something about sincere worship that's pure and pleasing and fragrant to the Lord. That's not just a Sunday morning song, but a week-long life that's laid down in holiness and purity unto Him. That means if there's sin in your life, don't wait till Sunday at church to confess it. Confess it immediately to the Lord and receive His grace and mercy and His forgiveness for it. Confess to a brother. Confess to a sister. You don't need to confess to Facebook. Confess your sins to a trusted brother or sister and, and keep them in confidence and then tell your high priest Jesus and he'll wash you whiter than snow and he'll make you clean and he'll make you new again so that you are ready to rock and roll in the spirit. Come on. Come on. There's a sincerity and a purity that the Lord is after. The church is not the mode where we gather and then all that kind of gets fixed. The the church is the place where we come together and just explode in worship to him. If you read Paul's writings to the church, if you just take a look carefully without preconceived ideas, you'll find that the purpose of the church is the development of God's people for God's work throughout the week. It's for the gathering and the exaltation of Jesus. It's for gifts of the Holy Spirit to flow in power and in might. It's for the exhortation and edification of the body so that we can move from where we are to where God's called us to be. Praise the Lord. Sincerity in worship. True worship sincere and it's faithful. How many of you know a faithful worshiper of the Lord? Just raise your hand if you've seen somebody who's faithful. That means that they didn't just do it once a month or once a year or or every other month or they're in a season this week of this and then next week they're in another season and they're far from God and don't want to talk to them. Then the next week it's a new season. Folks, seasons are not daily. (laughs) Let Let me just take a little pastoral moment here. A season is not daily. A season in God does not mean that next week you're in a different season, and the next week you're in a different season, and then the next week you're in a different season. A season is indicative. If you just look at the way God set up seasons, the Jewish calendar, the world around, a season is some measure of an extended period of time. So I've got some folk that I talk to in life, not, not necessarily here, I'm just talking about in general, because I have a lot of relationships, friendships, and and. Sometimes people get confused that a a, a single day of opposition or resistance is a season of resistance. That's not a season. Sometimes that's just the flesh. you got to rebuke it and move into the season God has for you. If you claim that as your season, you'll start experiencing that as your season. A, A season in God is a more extended period of time. I, God is looking for people who are steady. It's, it's roller coaster whiplash. Like I, life with God, when it's like, oh, this is great, Monday, I just love him so much. Tuesday, I'm in the trash. Like, I don't even know if I'm serving God anymore. And then Wednesday, oh, it's harp and bow, I can't wait. God is so good to me. And then Thursday, life is over. I'm in a season of pain and suffering. And, and it's just Friday, God's brought me into a new season. I'm stepping into the fullness. Saturday, you know what? I just feel so far from God. I, folks, that will make you exhausted. We've all been there. Let me just take away. The, we've all been there where we felt like life has been like this. But God is looking and saying, I got worship for you that is so steady and consistent by the stream of living water where you are rooted and planted and you don't have to go up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down every two days, every three. You can get in the stream of my presence and you can be my child and you can worship me. And yeah, you might have some good things that happen and we're going to celebrate 
celebrate that. And you might have some bad things that happen. We're going to be here for you, God says. And I've got the church here for you. And we're going to navigate those things together. But I am unchanging. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. I do not waver in who I am and in my promises for you. So don't worry, child, what you're experiencing that day or this day or that day. I am the same. I am with you. I am worthy of worship. And if you just start giving some consistent, faithful words of worship to the Lord, you start getting into that prayer closet and singing a song. You start opening up your mouth and worship to Him. You'll find that the, the, the brown dying leaves of what you feel might be a season every day start turning green again. You actually find out that life with God is more like an evergreen. In every season, He's the same. In every season, there's still a river that flows and makes glad the city of God. In every season, there's still nourishment and provision and protection and guidance and intimacy. Somebody needed to hear that. That has nothing to do with what I was planning to say. That's for whoever you are. Just open up your hands in front of you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak right now that there would be a rootedness and a plantedness in you, that there would be an access to the river every day, and that every day the leaf never withers or dies according to Psalm 1, but that there is a connectedness to you. There's a connectedness to you. Thank you, Lord. There's a, there's a faithfulness in worship. I know some faithful worship. I've seen some faithful worshipers in my lifetime. You know what they all had in common? Their worship was not predicated on their circumstance. There's not a faithful worshiper in the history of the world. Okay, that's, that's a big uh, exaggeration there, but it's true. Okay, that's a big net I'm throwing out. There's not a faithful worshiper who bases their worship off of the external circumstances. You cannot be a faithful worship and then let life dictate to you when God is worthy of worship. I feel like preaching. True worship fears the Lord in sincerity and faithfulness. It serves Him. It's about Him and as a result of that, it puts away all the other false gods and distractions. How many of you have ever felt distracted in your worship or prayer life or reading the Bible? That's called the devil. Okay, that's called the flesh. How is it that any time we want to do anything that's meaningless or pointless, we never get distracted? But then when we want to do something important... Read the word, pray, worship, spend time with our family. Invent. There's always some kind of goofy distraction. Sometimes they're serious and, and sometimes they're not. So, sometimes they're just distractions that do not warrant our attention, but sometimes they do. God is wanting to get us to a place where we can put away the busyness of life and other distractions. See, we, we make fun of Old Testament people like, oh, they carve a little gold statue and then sit it up on the mantle and worship it. What kind of people were they? God just split a Red Sea and then they carve stuff. Well, God does all kinds of miracles for us today and then we, we, we turn and, and we worship this. Now, they would think this is foolish. What kind of... What, what kind of people encounter that and then just, just like put their head down and f move their thumbs all day? You see that? What, what, what kind of people just, just never, never invest in, in anything in life but just kind of sit down and look at whatever's above the mantle and just watch images? See, when we talk about things on the mantle... It starts to hit home because it's not a gold image. It's a, it's a streaming image. We all have things that try to vie for our worship. But the Lord wants wholehearted worship that puts away those things. I'm not talking about in a fake manufactured manner. I'm talking about in a genuine way. I'm not saying you can't watch the Super Bowl. How many people are excited for the Super Bowl, for the commercials, for whatever? Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying you can't watch a movie. I'm not being legalistic here. I'm saying if our heart posture and if our schedule, if we are able to orient our lives in such a way that we can make time for that, and cancel everything for that, and give all our attention for that, and put our phones on silence for that, and not for him, then there's a false God there. 
Again, not condemnation or legalism, reality. Word of God coming in, penetrating our hearts and saying, where are you putting away the false things and giving me true wholehearted worship? How many of you are interested in keys that unlock wholehearted worship? I want something in my life that I can go to and put in the spiritual ignition and turn it and enter in. Here are some keys. Fear the Lord. Here's the truth. Fear the Lord. Serve Him. Make it about Him and not you. Do it sincerely. That means that your life is set apart and consecrated for Him, that you're entering in and you're taking time to enter in, not just to enter in once a week, but you're, you're purifying yourself and being cleansed by His sacrifice and His blood weekly. And then when you step in, you're ready to roll. It means that it's consistent. It's not contingent on circumstances. It's consistent in every season. It means that there's a rootedness there. And it means it puts aside everything else. That's some That's some wholehearted worship. I want to be known as that kind of person. That is an extraordinary legacy to leave. How many of you would say, that's how I want to leave a legacy right there. I want to leave a legacy of true worship. Look in verse 15, and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers serve in the region beyond the river or the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Write this down, the two paths of worship. I love how clear the Bible is. I'm not a huge fan of ambiguity and gray areas I like things fairly black and white. I like them to be fairly clear. That's in nature of my personality. I want there to be some kind of answer there that's, that's present. And Joshua does a great job at this, this historical site of worship, renewing the covenant that they are going to be a people of worship and commitment to God. I love that he made it so clear. We live in a time of unprecedented ambiguity where it's called, we're not even, some scholars and psychologists and sociologists say we've moved beyond what's called post-modernity now. There's the modern era, era, there's the post-modern era. Some people don't even know what to call what we're in right now. It's just a hodgepodge of ambiguity where everybody's living out their truth. Truth becomes subjective. You live your truth. I'll live my truth. The problem is that truth is not a set of propositions. Truth is a person. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said. So therefore, everything that comes out of the mouth and mind of God is truth. He reveals truth to us through the word of God and confirms it by the Spirit because not every single situation in today's world was covered in the Bible. You don't see anything about social media or technology about that. But there are truth principles that apply to that, okay? Because truth is not some ever-evolving, ever-changing paradigm. Truth is the person of Jesus. There's truth here, and, and I've got to tell about the truth of worship. He made it very, very simple. He said, you can either serve these gods, or you can serve the one true God. That's it. Paul later said in his letters that, that false gods or idols are actually demons that people worship. So if somebody is worshiping another god or set of gods than Jesus, they're worshiping demons. This is a little Bible theology here. I love throwing that in. So they will maybe get results and get things and see things in their life as a result of that because it's demonic deception. And demons will try to deceive people into being worshiped. Hello, witchcraft and, and Satanism and a number of other world religions. There are not multiple ways to God. There is only one way, and it's through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. There aren't multiple streams of truth. There's only one truth, and His name is Jesus. I'm not here to debate it. I'm here to communicate it. 
I'm not, I, when people say that's narrow-minded, I say, good, I'm on a narrow path. I'm on a narrow path that few people even find. Many will go on the broad path that leads to destruction, but if you want to get on the narrow path, you're going to have to narrow your mind. I'm not talking about narrow-mindedness in not listening to people and being rude to people. I'm talking about narrow to the things of God, to the Word of God, to the place of prayer, to the place of worship. I'm narrow in my faith focus. I'm on a narrow path. You're on a narrow path. He made it abundantly clear. He said, hey, hey guys, you remember those Amorites who some of y'all people are worshiping their gods? Do you not remember when the sun stopped in the sky and God absolutely demolished them? Do you not remember when the sun was supposed to set at X and it stayed up all the live long day and we defeated them? And you want to go serve that? You're telling me you want to go serve into, let's bring this home. You want to go serve gods, of, uh, deceptive gods of, of, of culture that have led people so far astray? You want to serve gods of entertainment that have destroyed family? You want to serve gods of addiction that only seek to break the family and crush the unity that God desires? You want to serve the... But you've seen what it does, and you see what God does. See, this is the juxtaposition Joshua, I'm trying to say Joseph and Jesus and everything else, Joshua put before the people. He said, you've got these raggedy gods who are worthless, and you've got one true living God. Why is it that you keep picking these raggedy gods who always lose? Pick the one true God. And I'm telling you today, stop picking things opposed to God. Stop going after false gods and false desires and demonic deception. You pursue the one true living God. You want to be a better father? Pursue the one true living God. You want to be a better wife? Pursue the one true living God. You want to be a better employee? Pursue the one true living God. You want to be a better friend? Pursue the one true living God and worship Him alone. I don't know what you're going to choose but I know what I'm choosing as for me and my house there is no other option there is no other path it's the Lord God of hosts it's the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone there are only two paths do not be deceived in Matthew 25 there are only two groups of people at the end of the age the sheep and the goats there's only the way of life and the way to death. There's only the narrow path and the wide path. See, the deception is the wide path has so many different little mini paths in it. And so it looks like, well, the majority is experiencing that and doing that. And they've seen some results from that. And doing that. No, no, no. Choose the one path. This is a cry that comes out throughout Scripture. Hannah in 1 Samuel 2 said, there is none holy they were battling, struggling, crying out for a child. There is none holy like the Lord. Talk about worship that's not contingent on circumstances. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Just like the saints of heaven cry in Revelation 15, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God. Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the nation, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name for you alone. That means there's nobody else. You alone are holy. All the nations will come and worship you for your righteous acts have been revealed. I'm going to choose the path of worship unto God. I hope that you will set in your in your mind and set it as a seal upon your heart like the Song of Solomon says that no matter what comes your way you are going to choose the path of sincere, genuine, and faithful worship unto the Lord. There are two paths and only one is worth taking. Look in verse 19, but Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord for he is a holy God and he is a jealous God. Write this down, the test of worship. This is where I'm going to land. The test of worship. Now, this is what Joshua said. Joshua has some guts as a leader. <laughs> this is, here, here's the scenario. 
All of them are gathered together for this covenant ratification renewal ceremony at the place of worship. They're all standing there together, and he's firing up the troops. And he's telling them there's only one God worth worshiping. There's only one God worth serving. I don't know about you, but I'm serving and worshiping the Lord. I'm making a decision today. And he says, who's with me? (laughs) And they all go, we are. We love the Lord. We love God. And he looks right at them and says, no, you don't. Okay, Joshua, my goodness. Be confrontational, please. You are not able to serve the Lord, for he's holy and he's jealous. This is something that's perplexed scholars for some time because he spent a whole chapter here riling up the troops and then they finally say and commit and covenant to do what he's asking them to. And then he says, no, you're not going to. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know anything about God. (laughs) Have any of you ever been in a service like that? I don't know if I've, I can't say that I have been in a service where somebody has asked, hey, who's ready to worship God or whatever? And they're like, we are. And they're like, no, you don't. (laughs) This is very strange. But I'm grateful for it. Because what he's saying is pertinent for us today. He's calling into question their true sincerity. He's saying everybody in the heat of the moment can go, rah, yeah, and hear the roar of a million people shouting, yes, we will serve the Lord and feel the emotion of the moment. But he says, hang on, no, 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 no. I want you to really, really, really stop and think about what this means before you become a witness against yourself. Because then God's going to hold you accountable for what you've agreed to. To the measure of knowledge and revelation that you have, this is what Jesus teaches in the Gospels again and again, you're going to be held accountable for that. So when you come in and say, I'm ready to be a wholehearted worshiper, and we all receive together and say, we want to do that and receive keys, and then do not apply it, we become like the seed that falls on the ground that Jesus describes, that lands initially in a good place, springs up, and has no root. I don't want to get to heaven and Jesus say, what was that about? (laughs) We did this whole worship thing and everybody was there and everybody was excited. And then the next 10 years, I didn't hear any fruit of lips. Talk to me about that. We become accountable for that which is revealed by the word of God. And today we all stand in reverential awe saying there is a message that's been communicated from Joshua to us about wholehearted worship, and there is a test. It's kind of like the vows at a marriage. You you go through this ceremony, there's such pomp and circumstance, everyone is excited, you move into the section of vows, and then you start talking about worse and sickness and health and better and worse and good and bad, and you start talking about the possibilities that may occur in life. Very few people say no in the vow, but over half of people reverse their answer in the journey. Joshua said, I don't want you to start making vows and then go into reversal mode. He said, if you make this vow, I want you to keep it. I want you to hold fast to it. I want you to make a memorial of it. I want you to cling to it. I don't want you to let it go. This is what Joshua did. He said, I want you to know what you are signing up for. If you choose to worship him, if you make this choice of wholehearted worship, you will start to become like him because we become like what we worship. We become like, as many have said before, what we behold, what our eyes are focused on, what our life is centered around, what our affection is driven to. It begins to form who we are and influence the type of person that we will become. That's why there needs to be a test. Because if you say yes to being a wholehearted worshiper, the expectation is that you start to look and act more like God. 
You start to see the fruit of the Spirit flowing in your life according to Galatians 5. You start to see that gentleness and patience flowing. You start to see that self-control against sin flowing. You start to see that love toward other people that you really don't like, but God puts love in your heart for them. You start to see a love that starts to flow. That's the test of worship. It's not just words of a vow. It's a life laid down to him in wholehearted worship. That's why on Mount Sinai, the Lord spoke to Moses and said this, Now therefore, if you will hear my voice and obey it and keep my covenant, you shall be treasured possession among all peoples. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's the real test of holiness or or worship. It's not how high you lift your hands on Sunday. It's how holy you walk throughout the week. That's wholehearted worship. That there is a consecration on the inside where you start to look different and act different and what you say around people and what you joke about around people, what you watch what you listen to, what you intake becomes different because you're becoming like him. You're becoming more and more like him. You're you're yielding. You're being formed. You're being conformed to the image of Christ. The test of worship. Not only does wholehearted worship require a measure of holiness. He said, for, for God is holy. That's why, that's why there's a test. He's, he's holy. You've got to understand, he's like nothing you've ever seen. He's like nobody you've ever talked to. He's like no one you've ever met before. He's in a category all by himself. And you need to understand before you go into this thing that he is totally different than anything you've ever experienced. He's holy. But he's also jealous. That means he's not after affairs. He doesn't want spiritual affair to take place. Have any of you ever read the book of Hosea? It's a gut-wrenching book where the prophet is instructed to stay married to his wife who's a prostitute. And he said, that right there is what you people are like. You're like a prostitute, but I'm going to love you into a wholesome, beautiful, faithful bride. That's what the Lord is after. That's the test of worship. He doesn't want our hearts pawned out to the highest bidder. He doesn't want our hearts given to things that disgrace his name. He does not want things that are so far from him to pull on our affection and our attention. He wants us and us alone. He will not play fair. He is jealous. He will begin to cut down the things that are in the way. He will begin to bulldoze the obstacles. He will begin to take things away from you. He will begin to remove things out of your life until you are His and His alone. He will not take second place. There is no second place, fourth place, tenth place for God. He is God and God alone. He will not have any gods before Him. There shall be no other gods before me, for I am holy and jealous. He's jealous for you. How many of you would dream of a relationship? I'm not talking about an un healthy jealousy. God is not unhealthily jealous where you're manipulative and vindictive and aggressive in your approach toward another person. But how many of you would love in a friendship, in a marriage, in a dating relationship leading to marriage, whatever situation, where somebody had a God-like jealousy over you, a love that was so pure and so intense that said, you are mine. There's a comfort in that. There's a beauty in that. And that's what the Lord says. You are mine. I'm not sharing you with other people. I'm not sharing you with other things. I love you too much to share you with gossip. I love you too. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to start convicting your heart. Because right now, gossip is your form of entertainment. 
I love you too much to let you read sports statistics and, and fall in love with sports more than me. So I'll put a pandemic and shut the thing down. Don't, that's not a, that's not a theological reflection of the nature of the pandemic. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm saying God can use that to get your attention. I'll shut the thing down. I will not share you with unholy sexual thoughts, fantasies, pornographies, and affairs. So I will expose the deeds of darkness and embarrass you in front of people because I love you too much to let you stay there. How bad is it? We don't want to get to a point where God has to expose it and then it gets embarrassed. It's better just to come into the light and get cleansed and cleaned up than to hide stuff and then get it exposed. He won't share you. He'll expose that thing. He will not let salt water come out of your mouth in private and then act like you're a pure stream in public. Foul language of all kind. He is a jealous and holy God. He wants wholehearted worship. He loves us too much. So out of his love, he disciplines us. Some of y'all feel the spanking from the Lord right now. Praise God. That means you're a child. He disciplines those whom he loves. You don't discipline somebody else's children. You only discipline your own children. You don't go around, walk around in the mall and start spanking kids who aren't obeying their parents. Getting a spanking is a sign that you're a child of God. When you feel conviction, say, thank you, God, that I'm not so far from you that I can't hear you anymore. Thank you, God, that you still love me so much that you will speak into that situation and pull me in and say, you will be my wholehearted worshiper. This is the test of worship. Don't just say, yeah, I'm wholehearted, I'm ready. Know that he's holy and he's jealous. And there's no second place. There's no other thing. He will bulldoze and like in December, create a flat place where every mountain will be brought low and every valley lifted up. And he'll ride right in into that holy place of your heart. Church, stand with me.